Welcome to Pop Unlock. I'm Landry Ayers. And I'm Aaron Powell. Before Bong Joon-ho's groundbreaking film Parasite was the darling of critics and the award season, the director already had at least one cult hit under his belt. A cold chronicle of civilization, crushed by climate change and community on the cusp of class conflict. Here to discuss the 2014 film Snowpiercer are L.org's own intellectual history editor, Paul Meany. Hello. And senior fellow at the Cato Institute, Jason Kuznicki. Hello. Snowpiercer is one of those movies that has a message with a capital M. It's very clear that they have something they're trying to tell you and they're trying to bake those ideas in in an unsubtle way. But like Don't Look Up, which we talked about on the show a couple of episodes ago, it feels like a movie where it's a little bit confused itself about what its message is supposed to be, or at least the message the movie presents is somewhat different from maybe what the filmmakers intended. And so along those lines, I guess I'm curious, is this a Marxist movie? I would say that if you read it in light of present day society, you might come away with a Marxist message. Or if you're a Marxist, you might say, aha, this reinforces my worldview. But when I watched it, I, I ended up coming away with a very different message. It seemed, it seemed like a, a, a pretty thoroughgoing uh, mishmash of different kinds of uh, concerns and symbols relating to them. Uh, there is uh, very early on in the film uh, a hint of the fear about chemtrails and there's global warming, which uh, they are trying to fight by putting a chemical in the atmosphere, but it backfires. So there are a lot of environmental themes, sort of. And then when we zoom in on the world of the train itself, we end up with a lot of symbols that are uh, in fact derived from very uh, long time ago, a very long time ago in European political thought. Uh, The train is a hierarchical society. Everyone is to have their place. There are supposed to be only so many people, only so many animals. And uh, a lot of this is uh, hearkening back to ancient political theory. In, in Plato's ideal society, there were only to be so many people. There were only to be so many places, and each person was to have their place. So, uh, so there's a lot going on here. I think on top of that idea of everyone having their place, there's something in medieval thought that's a very long name, but it's called the organological metaphor. And it's the idea of making metaphors with the body. And at one yes. part, one of the characters, Tilda Swinton's character, um, she says, like, you're, she's talking to people at the last carriage, she's saying you're the feet, I'm the head, and you wouldn't put like socks on your, your head and you just like you wouldn't put a hat on your feet. And it's that kind of argument that she always makes, that there's a chain of being, there's an order to the world that's been preordained and rebelling against it is not only pointless because it won't work out, but because it's against your very nature. And there's another part later on where the characters are talking about cutting off the water supply and she's like, well, obviously the water comes from the front. The water wouldn't come from the bum of the train. It's like this constant metaphor throughout the film of having like the head and the feet and just like there's, an, there's ancient and medieval political thinkers, you know, they describe the peasants and the low people as the hands because they do all the work and they describe, you know, the councils and the clergy, they're the head because they do all the thinking and at the very center of it all is the heart or the engine in this case, which is the leader. Yes, yes, there's a lot, uh, a lot of symbolism from uh, medieval Europe, the, uh, the, the whole symbolism of the shoe in this movie is really, really important. Uh, uh, showing showing a shoe on top of someone's head as a symbol of misrule is a really old you know, medieval peasant uh, political trope. Uh, we have uh, a hint of it in our own present day language in the familiar word sabotage. Sabotage comes from the sabot, which is a French peasant's shoe. And performing sabotage, of course, is to wreck things like you would in a, a revolutionary riot. And, uh, and that's exactly what we see in, in uh, part of uh, the film. But there is simultaneously a very, very modern uh, futurist take that goes on in this movie that 
really smacks of like capitalist realism to me which of course has a lot of underpinnings in in marxist ideology but is is much more about you know looking forward it it seems it's it's a little defeatist or 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 fatalistic um and i was reading one article by this uh this uh, professor at marquette who talked about how it's a more like depressive framing of of creative destruction that there is this necro capitalist like system inherently uh built upon and engaging with and prompting death as the engine of this this sort of marxist idea which in the end i mean you could say it's a marxist critique of capitalism but it also is fatalistic in a way that it presents no alternatives uh, the the only way to sort of disrupt this process and end the system is to blow it up entirely and even then are people that are you know the the train babies as they're referred to that survive they're left in the freezing cold, which we have only seen as the most harsh environment that freezes people's limbs off. They immediately come face to face with a fearsome predator, which is it, – it, I will say it is an interesting choice. And I heard that originally it was supposed to be like a, a deer, a much more sort of uh, you know arboreal like – uh, summertime, you know, a, a, an image of hope and peace. But I think the sort of stand-in for climate change, like using the the polar bear, which is you know the symbol that we all think about, you know, saving the polar bears and what what the future will become. It is an interesting sort of subversion of that idea to use it, but in a predatory uh, aspect. I think it's because normally when you see polar bears, you're like, well, there's not many of those left. And then when the the guy was saying, oh, the ice is going to melt, it's going to be fine. And the first thing you see out there is a polar bear. It's like, that guy was lying. We're doomed. Yeah, yeah. Life outside of the social order is going to be nasty, brutish and short, right? But uh, I would have to ask, is this really a depiction of capitalism? Where's the money? I don't see anyone using money. I see no markets. I see no entrepreneurship. I see a rigid hierarchical order in which everyone is forced to stay exactly where they are. There's no mobility whatsoever. This is uh, seems like it's a command economy rather than a market economy. I think one of the ideas I think that I really latched onto is if this is supposed to be a Marxist film, then why is it criticizing the feudal order that Marx wasn't really talking about? Like that was already done. That part of history was completed. We're onto overthrowing capitalism now through its contradictions. So why show the feudal background? And it was really confusing because one thing I think of a lot is the way the word revolution gets thrown around. It's normally always a positive connotation, but most revolutions throughout history, it's not really like the people rising up like Les Mis. Do you hear the people saying, it's normally a small elite cadre of people who enforce their will upon the rest of the world. That's 90% of revolutions then with military dictatorships or a small cadre of people. And so I think a lot of the films about how conservative revolutions actually are, like it's, it's so weird. Like we have a revolution, but it just so happens the tallest, most built white guy in the train will be our savior. Because revolutions, like they produce a certain kind of character that might be good for revolutions, but not good for what comes after. I think a lot of this film is based around environmentalism. And I thought the train was so interesting because the constant closed ecological system. And there was a lot of environmentalists in the 70s and 80s who wanted like a steady state economy where there was no more growth in the population, no more growth in production of resources. Everything is kept to a stable, sustainable limit. And it's like, it, it's more of that vision than a vision of capitalism, really. Because if it was capitalism, there'd be more cup holders, there'd be more things to buy. It would literally only be rich people. I know it's trying to criticize capitalism. I just don't really see it doing that all that much. Yeah, there's a, a definite uh, meet the new boss, same as the old boss kind of uh, dynamic to this, which uh, isn't completely out of touch with how politics can actually work, with how dynastic successions have worked through uh, many different societies, that uh, the guy who overthrows the old king gets to be the new king, and then his son gets to be king after that. This, is, this has happened before. And uh, when you have a hierarchical society with everyone stuck in their places, 
and you go around making that your ideal and then suddenly there's a revolution what's the thing that you put up again after the revolution it's a new hierarchical society you're you're back where you started I do think that one of the ways that this is about capitalism, at least in the minds of a lot of people, and if you, I was spending some time reading around discussions um, on Reddit about it and other places, and they all seem very convinced that this is this is a movie about how bad capitalism is. And like one person I found said, you know, that what makes this movie so powerful is it represents exactly what capitalism is. And and you said, you know, it's lacking it's lacking all the features of capitalism. It doesn't seem to have any production. It doesn't seem to have any trade. Um, it doesn't seem to have any workers, except for like a couple of people we come across. But most of the people are either just imprisoned, basically in jail cells, doing nothing but eating food that's given to them, or they're partying or hanging out or knitting. But I think for a lot of people, when they think of capitalism, they think the fundamental feature of capitalism is exploitation. That that's like what the system of capitalism is, is it is the rich exploiting the poor. And a lot of crude Marxism takes that viewpoint, um, at least rhetorically. And and that's where I thought it was really interesting how many people talked about this as if it were a Marxist film, as if it were an anti-capitalist film, because you guys are definitely right. Like it's not, there is no capitalism. There's no markets in this system. But even within that, it's striking how I guess, anti the fundamental message of Marxism, it is as well. Um, if we look at um, Bong Joon-ho's last film, Parasite, which has a similar vibe, like a lot of people took it as a as a critique of capitalism as exploitation, this rich family is exploiting this poor family and the poor family rises up. But both of these films end with basically the the old order overthrown violently, but the new order dead upon arrival. You know, everyone on the train's been killed. The whole family in Parasite has been, is is dead or, you know, imprisoned or back out on the street or locked in the bottom of the house. And, and so you don't come away thinking that the people who rose up were the good guys in this. Well, yeah, you don't want to, you don't want to put all your eggs in one basket, so to speak. And uh, when your entire order has to stand or fall together, that makes it vulnerable to sudden collapse. And the way to protect against that is to have it be so that it's not just one guy who is the only one who can run the show and the only one who can provide your food and the only one who can provide any form of social stability. Have lots of choices. Have many different choices. And that way, if one of them fails, you've got options to fall back on. What I thought was really weird was, is that this movie is supposed to be critiquing capitalism, which is all fair and good. But I find it so weird that the chemical was released into the environment that froze the entire planet. And there was only one person with the foresight, you know, to have something to survive this. And it happened to be the Howard Wark Randian hero with the tr railway line. Like, it's kind of that was, weirdly I ironic. Watched but, halfway through the movie, I was like, this movie is a sequel to Atlas Shrugged. There you go. It is. It's sort of a response to Atlas Shrugged. And... Uh, I really, I, I want to just kind of protest against the idea that the train even needs to move at all. You have this really powerful engine. I don't know what its fuel is, but apparently they've got plenty of it because they never worry about that. Why not just sit in one place and then you could build buildings and stuff and, and, and not have to, not have I to travel. I think the train is supposed and to keep going. I think the engine, like it continuously moves itself like if it stops moving it's done i feel like that's kind of what the lower is pointing towards i couldn't exactly glean anything from it that's like 100 percent the answer but i think it has to constantly well move. I, I don't think there's a technical there's not a technical reason for this there's no the kind of like so. deep engineering reason for it it's a symbolic reason they're going around the world because it's about going through the cycle of the year and they have regular holidays that they observe like the new year happens when they reach a certain bridge and uh and that's their their signal that the year has passed and so really what they're doing is they're moving through history together sort of like a nation would do and uh and so it's it's a symbolic thing it's not uh it's not an engineering thing and to to say well why didn't you just stop uh as i might have done is is not quite getting that point the point is that uh 
they are moving through time, moving through history, while trying to stay stasis, stay in stasis all the time. Curtis, Chris Evans' character, at one point, he says, if we control the engine, we control the world. And it's just like one tiny little line, but it shows you that he thinks this train is the entire world. And most of the characters, they actually don't spend very much time looking outside of the train because the train is their entire universe. They can't imagine a world outside. They maybe have never been there or haven't been there in years. So everything in this train super, super matters. There is nothing else. All of the conflict of humanity is focused on this one little place. It's interesting that you bring that up, Paul, because one thing that I noticed particularly in the performances of these different characters was the the sense of movement and the visual language of the film. Uh, the only characters that really take a moment to look outside of the train and and make use of the windows, except for the the brief moment when the people from the tail see sunshine for the very first time, they sort of you know squint their eyes and look outside and you know are looking out of windows for the first time. But then they immediately start you know charging forward to try and get towards the head. But uh, only. Uh, only the two that have been locked away. Namgung and Yona. Yes, uh, Yona. She is the one who goes to the window, and and he even like carries her over one point and is like pointing out. You and we learn later that they have plans that are much grander, and they're sort of the really I I would say like kind of accelerationist, you know, people who are thinking like we have to just get rid of the the train in order to make progress. Um, uh, but they're not worried about moving forward. They're like, we want to go outside the train. We want to think of extremely radical ideas and think of the, the the train beyond this world where everyone else is moving, you know, only along this one axis. And another thing that, that brings up is, you know, so often and, and specifically, you know, we use the language of hierarchies. We think of uh, classes as you know they're they're upwardly mobile there's lower classes and there's higher class it is it is baked into the metaphors that we use to describe class and this film subverts that and sort of cants it at an angle and you have it moving you know forward throughout time which has its own roots in in pr uh, progression and regression on a sort of linear axes but moving it specifically moves from left to right. The head of the train is almost always positioned at the right of the frame, and the left side of the train is always the tail. We rarely flip that angle and move from right to left while moving towards the head, which is a very distinct and rigid choice for them to make in the sort of cinematography of the film. And I was wondering if anyone else noticed that. and. We briefly brought up the idea of revolutions necessitating a sort of air of conservatism and moving from the left to the right seems to me like it might be attempting to signal or at least lament the fatalist way of viewing where you start with the idea of revolution and wanting to topple progress and and, and sort of uh, reinvent things and uh, free people, you know, free people from their chains as that were, but they end up moving further to the right as they move up the scales and and sort of end up in power. I, I think there is something to that. And there's one scene in which the train is sort of going both ways because it executes in, in as much as a, a train can a hairpin turn. Uh, where the rear cars are visible from the front cars perpendicularly and vice versa. It, it goes through a big U-shape, basically, on the track. And what happens? There's a shootout. They're, they're shooting at each other from across the way. Uh, yeah, there's, there's definitely left-right political symbolism, which uh, is deeply ingrained in Western politics all the way back to the French Revolution, and I think they are making use of it, definitely. Like the Matrix movies, this movie, the ultimate behind the scenes thing, is we've got this contained ecosystem and it gets out of whack eventually. And then what's needed is the the two sides to kind of come together and create something new that then allows it to exist for some 
period of time again until things get out of whack. And so we talked about whether this is Marxist, but now I'm wondering, is this movie Hegelian in the sense that it is a it's a it's a dialectic. We have a thesis and antithesis and they have conflict and then they come together and blow it all up and have a synthesis. But then we end up with a new thesis, a new antithesis, and it just keeps going. Is that the message of this, that this is it's taking a Hegelian view of historical dialecticism? I'd say it is. And I'd say that uh, Wilford in particular seems intent on uh, on it working out exactly that way. And he uh, uh, late in the film seems to uh, make this sort of uh, this speech to uh, Curtis where he's he's basically passing the torch to him and saying it's your turn to take my place and be at the head of the train. And obviously that means that he's inheriting all of the cruelty and all of the oppression that that brings with it, uh, but also a new stability and uh, potentially a, a new revolution down the line. Uh, history in this society seems to move only through conflict, which is very Hegelian indeed. And there's also a sense in that the history creates a lot of the society. Like you see the school for a brief time and you kind of get a little mini history of the world and you get to see that an awful lot of this movie, like history is ideology. And even the, the guy who's running the train, Wilfred, he eventually turns to Curtis and he's saying there'll be the story of Curtis's great revolution. And you get the idea that it's all just part of one big long story. Like the, the whole movie opens up with one character drawing pictures of what's happening. So you kind of get this weird idea of the historian that's kind of like an artist, but also someone who decides the, the rest of the fate of society based on the stories they'll tell, like what it'll all look like. You know, there'll be sacrifices here for some characters. I think it's very interesting. The angle the movie kind of takes. It raises the question about, about Hegelian philosophy. How much of it is really responsive to history as it happens and how much of it is responsive to the fact that we as people have been telling ourselves stories like this for a really long time and they're the stories that we expect to hear. And who knows, maybe they're, they're deeply ingrained in our, our, our heads on some very low level, but that doesn't necessarily mean we always have to have a society that proceeds through violent, largely pointless conflict where we're, we're just fighting about who it is in charge of the very pinnacle of a hierarchical society instead of pursuing a polycentric or a less hierarchical society in which there was much more dynamism, much more movement and innovation. At first I thought, you know, oh my God, when you see the school, these children are so indoctrinated. But as the film goes on, I think you realize that nearly everyone's indoctrinated, not in the same way. Like some people are indoctrinated to worship Wilford, but Curtis's character, they can't think outside of the train. They can't think of a revolution beyond just the train. They never move outside of that whatsoever. And it's always the main focus of everything. There's no real alternative solution whatsoever. And so in this kind of zero-sum game where there's some people on top, some people at the bottom, they just want to be on the top. Like, I, when I was watching the movie, I was so confused because and all the people from the, the back carts, they didn't seem too offended by the, heavy, the higher carts lifestyles. They're kind of like, oh, well, I'd like to have that too one day. Like, there wasn't really much anger over that. Like, we're supposed to be angry as the viewers, but I never really got the impression that the characters were too annoyed about it. They were just happy to be there, and then they're like, oh, that'll be us soon. In light of that, it's kind of striking. This just occurred to me that the only people who seem to have a plan outside of the train, um, the only person who seems to have a plan outside of the train, granted it doesn't go well, is the guy who built all of the gates and barriers keeping people inside the train, that he's he's like aware of the train as a confined space as opposed to the world because he's the one who confined it. Um, but we've talked about this stasis and, and we've talked about this issue of if this were really like a, you know, arch capitalist train, they would be running it very differently. They wouldn't be having workers who could be working productively locked in the back. They would be innovating, changing, making things that are available and so on. 
And it does seem like, and we've also talked about the the oddness of what they're doing. Like, why do they keep going around and around in circles? It doesn't seem necessary. Why are they on this train? It doesn't seem necessary. How much this is ultimately almost about like religion as a confinement, that they're they're stuck in this ideological mindset and that the the ideology, and we see this in like our current world, you know, we as libertarians are like, guys, just kind of drop some of the ideological blinders and leave people alone to do what they individually want to do and everything will get better. Um, but they're but then you have your national conservatives or your your kind of far left people stuck in this ideological worldview. Like that seems to be a real key component in this is that if everyone could just drop this this set of odd beliefs about the nature of the world, about their place in it, and about the purpose of all of these things they're doing, then all of their lives would get radically better. Yeah, the uh, the locksmith, uh, I'm going to, to butcher his name because I don't speak Korean, and for that I'm sorry, but uh, Namgun Minsu, the, the, the guy who built the doors, he's the only one who wants to move laterally rather than to the front of the train. He has this plan that he's he's got all this explosive he's saved up and he wants to blow up one of the side doors so that they can leave, which is very different from the revolutionary plan, very, very different uh, from what Curtis wants to do. Uh, and uh, he was sort of the only one who really seemed like he had any chance of effectively taking on the system, effectively subverting it. As to religion, there's a lot of religious language. The engine is sacred, we keep hearing. It's sacred. It is uh, so important that we have set it outside of society and it's it's like its own eternal thing that has to last forever. And it's what gives us whatever claim on eternity that we may have as a society. That's very similar to how a lot of uh, nationalist ideologies place God in relation to their nation. Our nation is uh, trying to be eternal and trying to live up to a, a mandate to do so from God. We derive our strength from God. Very, very similar. But when Curtis sees the cracks, that's when he changes his mind. He was going to become the leader. He was going to become the new Wilford. But once he looks down under the panels with Yona, he sees that there's a child uh, cranking like the inner mechanism of the machine. And Wilford eventually says, oh, yeah, that part went extinct. And you could just say Curtis is personally aggrieved by the suffering of a child. But it's also like the illusion is shattering. It is not the sacred engine that you think it is. It is not special. It is really just a machine. And one day, like every other machine, it'll break down. So I think that the circular part of the film feeds into a very, very niche theory where there's a very ancient historian called Polybius. He had this theory called Anasoclysis, which was that humans, they're originally anarchic, they live in the state of nature, nasty, brutish, and short. But one person comes along, kind of becomes like their king, gathers them together. But then the next person, the son of the king, he's not going to be a very good king, so he'd have to go with the harsh parts, so he'll become a tyrant. Then there'll be the best people who overthrow him, and then they'll become the new aristocracy, but their sons will come along and they won't be great aristocrats, they'll be oligarchs. So the people will overthrow them for freedom and equality. But then the next people come along, they don't appreciate freedom and equality. And so it goes back to the anarchic state. And then this kind of cycle goes over and over and over again. And revolution, again, is one of those words that's changed a lot. Revolution originally meant to return to first principles. And so from Wilford's perspective, the revolution is a good thing because it returns to first principles and gets everyone focused on the closed ecological environment that they live in. And so I think that in some ways, revolutions can actually make systems stronger and can limit our imaginations because we only think of seizing the reins of the state, not the, all the alternative ways we could subvert it or live against it. We don't really think of civil disobedience. We start thinking of storming buildings and stuff. It's interesting you bring up the sort of lineage of all of the people that will assume the roles of power um, and sort of take up the mantle of the person who's keeping the engine. You know, you've got Ed, Ed Harris as Wilfred at the very, very beginning. Always love to see Ed Harris coming in just randomly. Uh, did not know he was going to be in this movie. Loved seeing him there. Um, and then we have uh, Chris Evans. It's Chris Evans, right? He's the Chris that we have. Yeah, it's Chris Evans. Um, and he comes in 
And then we think that he is this hero that is going to be taking over the entire film. 90% of the movie is about him moving forward on the train. Um, and he, we sort of see him, you know, give this that he eventually reveals to the audience that he is not the person that we always thought he was as this sort of hero of his people that in reality he is you know as reflective of the sort of nastiness of this system that they've created on the train as anyone else and he was responsible for uh you know tr attempting to steal and eat a, a baby from a woman and murdering her in the process um and and there's sort of a a twist there but then uh, Yano comes in and she is the one that in this supernatural, um, clairvoyant manner is able to sense somehow that there is a child underneath this tile that she is able to reveal and, and show to him and sort of reveal the truth to him in what ends up in a sort of dual way being an apocalyptic way of, of showing it to him is it not only prompts the end of the world but it is uh, a, a revealing to him of what is going on underneath um and i think the choice of chris evans captain america one of the the few well not few but one of the you know prominent white american actors that we have in this film that is uh, really amazing in its transnational cast. It's a, it's a wonderful production and is, uh, uh, I think, an effective example of a global uh, cinema industry that is is actually one of the one of the coolest parts of the film for me. Um, and one of the things it does not get as much credit for as it should, and as other films of Bong Joon Ho has done, like Parasite uh, and Okja and Moving Forward. Um, but he, Chris Evans, is not the one that actually ends up saving anybody. It is people from other parts of the world. It is a black child and a Korean woman who actually end up saving the film. And I think this is an, an interesting choice that I like that subverts the, I mean, it it is not the typical white savior narrative in that, but he is the white savior character that we get throughout the history of or, or throughout the plot of the film. Yeah, Curtis has a he's got a real kind of Luke Skywalker similarity that he's he's uh, got both good and evil within him and he has to wrestle with those and he has to confront not his not his literal father, but the person who's sort of a father figure to everyone. And the message of this father figure is join me and rule the world. And, uh, and Curtis uh, and ends up rejecting that, but he does not have, like you said, any kind of a path forward. He does not have, once he reaches the front of the train, he's got nowhere else to go. And uh, it's Yona who saves everybody, sort of, uh, you know, kills most of them. But insofar as anybody is saved, it's because of her. Yeah. What do we make then of that ending? Because the way the movie presents it, the way it's shot and the music and the fade out on white and so on, makes it feel like the movie thinks it's a hopeful ending. The train has been stopped. The engine's been overthrown. The, you know, the two survivors make it out, but it is a relentlessly grim ending. Like all of the people that they fought this battle through the however many cars to save, with the exception of two, have been killed and killed by the people who were attempting to save them. Uh, the the train, which may or may not be their only, it certainly is their only source of food. In, in this des in this like snowy wasteland. I've watched enough episodes of Survivor Man to know that there's not a lot of food out there when you're trying to survive in like the snow. Uh, that's gone. And and we're not quite sure how cold it gets, but we know it gets at least cold enough that it throws a guy's arm off in seven minutes. And and there's the polar bear, which might be this sign of nature recovering, but it might also be a sign that they're about to get eaten. And so it's it's hard to imagine that they are going to have much success after the fade to credits, unless the the only the only thing that I, I saw someone suggest, but I'm not sure I buy this, is 
the fact that there is the polar bear is a sign that things have lived outside the train. And if things have lived outside the train, then there's probably people who have lived outside the train. And so that this wasn't the last two humans. But that seems like a, a stretch. Well, that's really speculative, yeah. There are, there are other science fiction stories I can think of where there's uh, a seeming end of the world and then uh, it turns out that there's a small uh, nucleus of humanity that survives and as they are expanding, they find other humans who also survived. That happens in Neil Stevenson's Seven Eves, for example. Uh, I hope I'm not giving away too much there. Um, but the fact is, in, in the film, they don't actually find any other humans. They just see a polar bear. It's really ambiguous to me whether humanity survives or not, given what they have at the end and what we can see on the screen. I was just so confused. It was supposed to be like a good ending, but then you see some of the, it doesn't just stop the train. Some of the cars fly off into the abyss. Like people must have died in such a gruesome way and I'm supposed to be happy about it. And then the only people left are like a 17 year old and a child. I'm not exactly hopeful. So I get that the ending had all this important symbolic meaning and it was interesting, but I'd just be so mad if everyone had died. So two people could go off and freeze in the snow 30 minutes later. Yeah, it's not a very hopeful ending, I don't think. I mean, it's possible they survive, but who even knows? Also, they got really mad about eating bugs. And granted, if people are talking about eating steaks for years and then they're feeding you mashed up like insects, like just in little bars, I would be angry too. But I was thinking back on it. And to me, it kind of was akin to like the uh, you're getting ideas throughout the whole movie about this sort of possible uh cannibalistic or like a uh, blood sacrifice of children like looming threat of what the front of the train does to these children that have gone missing the whole time but it, it's playing on this sort of like soylent green you know we're eating our own fear um and I didn't get that until the end, but looking back at all these moments throughout the first part of the film, I thought maybe that they were trying to sort of amp up that fear that before they show actually what's in the grinder with all of the bugs, what they're doing is they're opening it up and you're seeing their reaction and you're expecting it to be the children um, that are being you know, fed to these people. And that, but they save that, and they sort of subvert the the, the scare until later on, um, when it seems like it it might be even more heart wrenching that they're putting these children to work and you know making them suffer long term rather than killing them outright. When I actually watched this movie with my dad and brother, my dad pointed out they were measuring how long the kids' arms were, and he's like, "Oh, they're probably using them with their machines," and I was like. Oh, yeah, because like they have to get small people into the machines. He's like, yeah, you said that during the Industrial Revolution. I was like, oh. So that's how I kind of figured that one out early on, luckily. But I, I feel like every sci-fi movie has to have slime with aliens or some sort of goopy food that doesn't look nice. You can never have in the future nice-looking food or anything. It always has to be blocks of jelly that you really grimly eat. Yeah, and they're made of like ground up bugs. Uh, it, the question I have is, where's all the plant based food? <laughs> you know, it takes an awful lot of plants to make a steak. They've got to be growing them somewhere, right? What's going on here? If you try to add up all the different questions that arise about how they get their food, how they get their fuel, all that, it makes no sense at all. It really does not. It's. It's got uh, almost a, a, a mythical quality to it because it's so detached from how actual resource and energy flows would have to work to do the things that they were doing, to stay on that train and to survive in the way that they do. They would need to make frequent stops somewhere with a normal climate. It, it just doesn't work. Also, the train is is shockingly short. They go from, like they said, Chris Evans goes from tail to head, and we see, I don't know, how many, what, seven, ten cars max? And the only things that can fit underneath the train are children because there are tiny moving parts. There are no cows. They, they have to be doing some sort of plant-based food 
but not using it to maintain livestock, I'm assuming. But also there's sushi and there's uh, you know, all sorts of alcoholic beverages. And you know, it's, it's uh, uh, we're supposed to take it in not as any kind of political economy, but as, as sort of a fantasy. Right, right. But then that brings up, again, the the assumption by a lot of people that this is a movie about capitalism and a metaphor for how capitalism works, because it's it's a film. If that's the case, it's a film that would have benefited from reading I Pencil or something else about, you know, how resources get turned into things and how much stuff it takes to make things and and why it wouldn't make any sense to have a bunch of people locked up at the back of the train who you're just feeding bugs to when they could be, you know, contributing in a in a productive way to, you know, I mean, if you were if you're the evil capitalist, the very least you should have these people like tilling the soil in one of the trains or something like it just it just fundamentally doesn't make sense as a metaphor for capitalism. And that's why it's so interesting how many people seem to see it as a metaphor for capitalism. And I think it's an indicator of just how little idea a lot of people have about like how a market economy functions and where things come from. Yeah, the, in, insofar as there are plant-based foods, there's not nearly enough uh, not to, to feed animals or whatever. And... Uh, What's the first one you see? Orange trees. Orange trees, which were the uh, 17th and 18th century absolute monarch's favorite kind of plant. Uh, if you go to Versailles today, you can see the orangerie, where uh, the king's orange trees were kept in the winter. And there's another one at Hampton Court, which is the uh, same idea. Uh, but there's not, like rice or wheat or corn there's no there's no kind of uh, staple foods there yeah it seems to be a film like aaron was saying not about what capitalism is but what capitalism is seen as and you could maybe make the argument of what people have been making excuses and calling capitalism, you know, in so much as you know, we don't always have a pure market-based economy, even in countries where we have made a lot of progress in implementing market-based reforms uh, in that way, um, there is still a certain degree of violence enacted by people in power that functions in a state manner which then influences and sucks up and stops market-based benefits from actually being beneficial to all people. So it is about not what capitalism it, – it is not a critique of capitalism in its true form, but how capitalism has failed to be enacted in its most ideal sense, you could argue – which then becomes in the you know meaning making rather than the that uh, break between the connotative and denotative uh, functions of capitalism in society. Yeah, yeah. To the, the extent that this fails as a a critique of of capitalism, I would say that it fails in taking capitalism for a static system. Uh, capitalism is not static. It's constantly changing. It is dynamic. And when you hear Mason talking about how important it is that everything should stay in its place and there's a hierarchy and everything must remain exactly the same, that's, that's a bad thing. That's a thing that we should be mistrustful of. Societies that aim at stasis become fragile, and then they break. But that's not what capitalism aims at. Capitalism is uh, dynamic. It makes room for entrepreneurs. A, a better critique of capitalism, if you wanted to make a critique of capitalism, would be that it brings chaos, that it brings new unexpected things that disrupt society. 
uh, a lot of episodes of Black Mirror are like that. They they work much better to to my way of thinking as as critiques of capitalism, bringing something awful that we didn't think about, and now we all have to suffer in the consequences of it. I don't personally think that's what capitalism tends to do, but yes, it does bring changes. Thanks for listening. As always, the best way to get more Pop and Lock content is to follow us on Twitter. You can find us at the handle at Pop and Lock Pod. That's Pop, the letter N, Lock, with an E like the philosopher, Pod. Make sure to follow us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen, and please rate and review us if you like the show. We look forward to unraveling your favorite show or movie next time. Pop and Lock is a project of Libertarianism.org, is produced by me, Landry Ayers, and is co-hosted by myself and our director and editor, Aaron Ross Powell. To learn more, visit us on the web at Libertarianism.org.